<laughs> we have Monsieur Masoud Balouamer from Algeria, who is serving at the African Commission on Nuclear Energy. We are very honored to have him here to speak about Pelindaba and what Africa is doing with regard to nuclear weapons free zones. But before we, uh, Monsieur Masoud speaks, we will have Jean giving an overview, a more macroscopic view of nuclear weapons free zones and the comprehensive test ban treaty and why it was important. I think it's incredibly fortuitous that Monsieur Masoud is from Algeria and Algeria basically is what started Africa's interest and involvement in making sure that the continent would be nuclear weapons free because of the testing that was conducted by France, the indiscriminate, atrocious, much covered up testing that was conducted by France in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s. Jean, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Nomsa, and uh, good, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And I'm also very pleased to share the um, screen with uh, um, a longtime associate, uh, Mesoud. We're very pleased to see each other again. Um, so as Nomsa mentioned, I have been involved in uh, both the establishment of the CTBT and the Pell and Alba Treaty, the African Nuclear Weapon Free Zone TV. And so um, I'm very pleased to talk about it. Uh, you will probably notice that I am quite passionate about both these treaties. Um, and uh, I will give some, some insights into the negotiations um, as well. But uh, also let me be very clear from the outset that I'm a staunch anti-colonialist. Um, and I will refer to two blatant um, violations of both human rights and um, international law uh, by uh, colonial powers in Africa. The one uh, Nomsa already referred to, uh, the, the tragic test uh, that occurred in Algeria in 1961. But um, so the idea of this talk is to give you an overview of uh, nuclear weapon free zones and the CTBT, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, and how they are mutually reinforcing. Um, so on the, on the um, cover slide, you will see a map on the right. And it's an interesting map because it gives you the areas in brown, all the areas covered by nuclear weapon free zones. Um, the areas in red are the nuclear weapon states if you look closely enough, you'll see uh, little uh, kind of large squares. Those are the countries that are required to ratify the CTBT for it to enter into force. Those of you who were at the session hosted by the Vienna Center for Disarmament Affairs this morning uh, may have heard more about that. I will touch upon it very briefly. So um, where did it all start? It started in on the 16th of July, 1945, with the Trinity test, uh, you already had a very good lecture by Dr. Ferenc Dalnoki Ferez about nuclear weapons. So I'm not going to go into all the details, simply to reflect that, uh, you know, we are not dealing with, with abstract concepts here. Uh, we're dealing with massively destructive forces. Uh, and as Dr. Oppenheimer, uh, who was the chief scientist of the Manhattan Project, reflected as he looked upon that red fireball, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst into, at once into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. Now I am become death, destroyers of worlds. Now that's um, part of the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and uh, Dr. Oppenheimer recalled this uh, in a video interview um, later after the test and you if you google it uh, you will uh, also be struck by how emotional he was um, the picture on the right is him sitting next to what was called the device uh, as you can see that does not look like a, a bomb um, it was uh, mounted uh, several meters above the ground on a tower where it was detonated um, but since then um, the world has seen um, more than 2,000 nuclear tests. Uh, by um, eight countries. And all the countries that are nuclear weapons today, with the exception of Israel, have uh, 
declared their nuclear test. There are some speculation that Israel may have conducted the test. Uh, so you can see on this graph what we used to call at the CTBTO as the fever chart. It really measures uh, the, the, the fever of international relations. And you'll see there, for instance, uh, in 1961, uh, how the fever spiked. Um, and of course, in 62, uh, you know, those years of this is the missile, Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, you, you'll see linkages to the Berlin Wall, uh, detente. Um, you'll also see a gap in 1959, and that's the time when um, they tried to negotiate a comprehensive test ban in Vienna, uh, in Geneva, and uh, that failed, and then um, massive testing reoccurred. But what you also see here is um, in 1996, uh, from 1996, a flattened curve. Uh, and that's when the CTBT was signed, and I'll come back to that. So 2047 nuclear explosions occurred uh, between 1945 and when the treaty was signed. Um, and you can see the numbers by the, the major nuclear powers. Um, that means that one test was done every nine days for 50 years. Um, now, that, that is not an environment that you wish to, um, to live in. Yeah, I'm sure you will all agree that um, living in uh, the environment that we are today, while North Korea conducted a few tests, the last one in 2017, um, we are in a far better environment than living uh, in an environment where so many tests have occurred. Where did they take place? Um, mostly uh, in the territories of the United States and the Soviet former Soviet Union, but the former Soviet Union, of course, also included uh, a number of other countries, most notably Kazakhstan, uh, where most of the Soviet tests took place. But uh, Algeria tested its first weapons, uh, I'll beg your pardon, France tested its first weapons in Algeria in 1961. Uh, France also tested in the Pacific, so did the United States and the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom also tested on the territory of Australia. Um, India, Pakistan uh, tested on their own territories, uh, and so did uh, in North Korea. So um, you also hear the concept about peaceful nuclear explosions. Now, I put peaceful in parentheses uh, because I don't think there is such a thing. Uh, but there was, believe you me, um, uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, strong um, interest in how to use a nuclear explosion uh, for non-military purposes. Um, and the picture that you see there um, is the sedan crater in Nevada in the United States. On the, on the former, on the test site where the United States conducted most of its tests, it's the largest human-made crater in the world. Um, it is about 150 uh, meters across, about 100 meters deep, um, and it uh, pumped millions of uh, tons of, of um, sand into the atmosphere that it was radioactive. This is a picture taken while we went, when I was at CTBTO when we visited there uh, for a training exercise. Um, the picture on the bottom right is the Russian or the Soviet version. They did a similar test uh, in Kazakhstan and hit a underwater artery, uh, underwater river, and uh, created a lake. Um, and uh, that lake obviously was radioactive. On the top right is just to show how ridiculous uh, the thinking was. Uh, scientists of uh, Los Alamos Nuclear Lab um, thought that it would be a good idea in case the Panama Canal uh, became a political uh, hostage, uh, as was the case of the Suez Canal during uh, the, the uh, war between Israel and Egypt in the 60s. They thought it would be a good idea to blast two additional canals uh, through Central America using uh, thermonuclear weapons. Of course, that never happened. Uh, but these were the plans to, to use. Um, peaceful nuclear explosions are also referenced in the NPT, Article 5, uh, had has since been um, interpreted as no longer uh, in, uh, in place, given the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. 
So let's move to nuclear weapon free zones. What are they? Um, I don't know, you may have in, in, uh, in your countries uh, some references to that. Of course, Africa is a nuclear weapon free zone, a legally binding uh, nuclear weapon free zone. Uh, no African country uh, have nuclear weapons. Uh, they all belong to the NPT. Um, but you see around the world, and here in the United States, you see it quite often, um, signs outside of cities to say these are nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, the top picture on the left is a former student of ours who now works at the IEA. Um, and he is a uh, dual, dual Italian US citizen. Um, and that's a picture outside his town. Um, and the one to the next to it, the Santa Cruz, which is a town just north of Monterey, which is also a nuclear free zone. Um, these are, you know, local declarations by city councils. They, of course, um, have political significance, but they don't have legally binding um, uh, impacts. Wait, hold on, I went too, too fast. So nuclear weapon free zones are internationally binding agreements amongst a group of states that effectively prohibit the development, the manufacturing, control, possession, testing and transporting of nuclear weapons within that zone. Um, and that's the official UN definition. And like the NPT, they all permit peaceful uses and applications of nuclear energy under IEA safeguards. Now, um, former uh, Mexican foreign minister, Alfonso Garcia Robles, uh, who was widely considered to be the father of the Tlatelolco Treaty, the uh, Latin American nuclear weapon free zone, and as a result, uh, also other treaties, because that treaty was the first one, um, he described nuclear weapon free zones as a zonal approach that would contribute to global nuclear weapon elimination by gradually shrinking the areas for which nuclear weapons were seen as a legitimate part of national or regional security. And if you can see the map on the top right, you can see what uh, Robles had in mind. Uh, already the global south is mostly covered uh, by nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, and large parts of the northern as well. So you can you can look at it if you if you think about peeling an orange, um, and you know as you as you as you remove the skin of the orange, it's gone. Um, and so uh, that's the concept of of a of a nuclear weapon free world through nuclear weapon free zones. So briefly, a little bit of history. Um, nuclear testing and nuclear weapon free zones go hand in hand. Um, during the 50s and early 60s, nuclear testing peaked. Um, Prime Minister Nero from India called for a standstill agreement. Even the foreign minister of Poland, Arapeci, called for a uh, nuclear weapon free zone in Central Europe. But it was really the French test in Algeria in, in uh, February of 60 that resulted in the African Organization for African Unity to uh, stand up and say enough. This will not happen in our territory. Um, uh, the uh, OAU adopted a, a resolution. It was in fact, I think it was its uh, first resolution that it adopted. And uh, later the UN General Assembly did the same. Um, and, but it was also the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis that spurred the Latin Americans to, to take this on. In fact, um, the Brazilian ambassador um, to Algeria was one of the key players in establishing a, a nuclear weapon free zone in Latin America because of, of the impact of the uh, tests in Algeria. Um, and uh, then we see, you know, China conducted a nuclear test in those days were considered, China was considered not capable by the Western countries of doing that. And it really shook them um, and woke them up. Um, and then of course we saw the impact of the NPT in the mid sixties and the Latin American treaty was signed uh, in 1967 uh, and was actually predates the NPT. Um, so it is, in fact, the, the oldest non-proliferation and, and disarmament treaty that we have. Um, also very notable, in 1974, uh, India conducted the so-called Smiling Buddha peaceful nuclear explosion, which, was, which is the picture uh, here that showed um, that India was capable of, of doing a nuclear weapons program. Uh, the picture with the 
the, the, with the nuclear explosion, uh, with people waving, those are French soldiers in the uh, desert of, of Algeria witnessing uh, the, the French um, test. So the General Assembly, um, as a result of um, all these activities, in particular also after the Indian test, um, when Pakistan proposed the idea of a South um, Asian nuclear weapon freezer, came up with criteria. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all the detail, um, but it's basically that it must be an agreement between states of the zone concerned about the total absence of nuclear weapons uh, under a mechanism of verification and control. But nuclear weapon states must respect these. Otherwise, you know, what's the purpose? Countries of nuclear, non, countries of nuclear weapon free zones are all non-nuclear weapon states. And therefore uh, you would assume, so what, uh, why would they, why would they have to uh, adopt another treaty? The whole concept behind nuclear weapon free zones is that the nuclear weapon states must respect the nuclear weapon free nature of those territories, meaning that they cannot deploy weapons in them, they cannot test weapons in them, and they cannot threaten those states with nuclear weapons. Um, the very first and up until now, the last special session of disarmament that adopted a final declaration in 1978, further uh, defined these, these um, criteria um, to what you see. Uh, it must be a clearly defined zone, must be recognized by the General Assembly, and of course, there must be no nuclear weapons. If you're interested to learn more about this, you can look at the guidelines for nuclear weapon establishment, nuclear weapon free establishment agreed by the United Nations Disarmament Commission in 1999, uh, which I was fortunate to participate in. Um, the United States, as other nuclear weapon states, uh, have their own principles. And these are more or less similar to what the General Assembly um, adopted, with the exception of the two marked in yellow. Um, and that means that the United States, when they can look at a nuclear weapon free zone, they, they consider that it should not infringe on existing security arrangements. This, of course, is NATO uh, and other arrangements, such as nuclear, the, the forward deterrence policies, such as nuclear umbrellas, and that it should not affect the rights of states to grant transit or overflights. Uh, of course, the U.S. being a uh, global power uh, with uh, large tactical um, aircraft and uh, ves ocean vessels that carry nuclear weapons um, do not want to be um, contained in how they can deploy those vessels. Uh, those two elements, however, are quite controversial and in some cases are not um, embedded in existing nuclear weapon free zones. So what's the relationship between nuclear weapon free zones and the NPT? Well, the NPT is rather vague when it comes to where nuclear weapon states can actually, whether they can share their nuclear weapons. In the case of the United States, it's a clear example. Uh, US nuclear weapons are based in Europe. There are some nuclear weapons in Germany. There are in, some in the Netherlands and in Belgium uh, and a number of other European countries. These weapons are under dual control, meaning that their release obviously can only be mandated by the US head of state. Uh, but the, the aircraft that are flown to drop those weapons can be flown by German pilots um, as well. So you can argue that these weapons are shared with Germany or uh, with NATO. And that is um, very controversial in the NPT. Well, nuclear weapons free zones prohibit that completely. Um, so um, the United States uh, cannot well, say it has a, it, it's, a, it's one of its strongest allies in the South Pacific is Australia. Uh, it cannot place nuclear weapons on Australian territory because Australia is part of a nuclear weapon free zone. But nuclear weapon free zones reinforce non-nuclear weapon states obligations under Article 2 and 3, meaning that they are not allowed to acquire nuclear weapons and that they must um, implement safeguards, uh, comprehensive safeguards. And in fact, the, the Central Asian zone uh, requires even the additional protocol. Uh, they also, nuclear weapon-free zones is a, um, a route to 
achieving complete nuclear disarmament as is envisaged in Article 6 of the NPT. I always mention that the NPT Article 6 starts with the word all, meaning that all states are responsible for nuclear disarmament, not only the nuclear weapon states. And so this is the, how African states and other countries part of nuclear weapon free zones contribute to a world free of nuclear weapons. Um, they create transparency, of course, and I think that I'll reference that to the case of, of, of Pelindaba, um, that the um, African treaty was important when South Africa gave up its nuclear weapons for, for neighboring countries and other African countries to be satisfied that Af South Africa no longer has nuclear weapons. That creates transparency um, and uh, confidence building between states. The one Achilles heel in my view and nuclear weapon free zones is that if they are not fully respected by nuclear weapon states, they're not effective. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, the nuclear weapon states must pledge to respect the zone and abstain from threatening members with nuclear weapons. Now, we have seen over the years many cases where that is not the case, especially um, in, in, uh, with regard to the United States and how it um, portrays force um, towards uh, some of its adversaries in, in other parts of the world, including in Africa. Um, nuclear weapon uh, states shall not test on zonal states. Um, now, uh, since the CTBT was signed, um, no tests have occurred uh, on the territories of countries um, that are no longer uh, under the control of um, their formal colonial powers um, because these countries are all independent now. Um, but uh, I'll come back to that. Yet the, some nuclear weapon states have not yet made good on that pledge. And then thirdly, uh, they should not threaten to use nuclear weapons against states in that zone. Uh, but this is a qualified commitment. Uh, the United States in particular issues every eight or so years what is called the Nuclear Posture Review. And this, what the, the text quoted there is the Posture Review of the former Trump administration. And it says that the United States will not use or threaten, use, threaten to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states, provided they are a party to the NPT and in compliance with the nuclear uh, non-proliferation obligations. Now, the, on, on the face value, this doesn't sound bad. Of course, who determine whether they are in compliance? You can argue the United States consider that Iran is not in compliance, and therefore you can deduct from that that Iran could be threatened with US nuclear weapons. So I'm gonna go over the next few slides very briefly because I wanna spend more time on the Pelindaba Treaty. Um, these are all the nuclear weapon free zones around the world covering the territories of 109 countries and most of the Southern hemisphere. Uh, of course, outer space is technically also a nuclear uh, weapons free zone because no nuclear weapons free, nuclear weapons must be placed in, could be placed in outer space. And then also the seabed treaty. Um, no nuclear weapons can be placed on the seabed, but it does not say uh, what happens between the seabed and the surface. Um, so uh, very briefly, we have the Antarctic treaty. It is a nuclear weapon free zone. Um, uh, so that you know, you can see the there's no military applications could be could be put in the Arctic, including uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, the Treaty of Tlatelolco, the oldest one uh, for Latin America. Uh, the South Pacific nuclear weapon free zone uh, came as a result, direct result, in response to all the nuclear tests that were conducted in uh, the, on the South Pacific islands, um, and many of them destroying islands like the Bikini Atoll. Um, destroying the livelihood of people. And these were all done by the United States, France, and the United Kingdom. Um, even, as I said, in Australia, uh, um, and that had a severe impact on the um, uh, Aboriginal people in Australia and continue to do so today. Uh, like uh, in, in large parts of Africa, uh, people are nomadic and they, they travel around, they, they are, dependent on, on the land that they travel through and large parts of that land still be, are still inhabitable because of nuclear testing. The Marshall Islands, for instance, uh, parts of those islands are off limits because they are still uh, more radioactive that, uh, 
than even um, in, in large parts of, of Europe where, uh, where uh, nuclear accidents have, have, have happened. Um, what I want to point out here is that uh, interesting that the protocols uh, by the nuclear weapon states have not all been signed, not notably um, not by uh, the, the um, United States. So for some reason, the United States still consider that it could potentially place nuclear weapons in these territories or test them, um, which you can only wonder why. Um, Mongolia, this is an interesting concept. Mongolia squeezed in between nuclear weapon states, uh, China, um, the Russian Federation, um, and uh, it declared itself a nuclear weapon free area. Um, and so that, that's another interesting concept. Uh, the Treaty of Bangkok, uh, the Southeast Asian zone, uh, also very important because of where it's located. Um, just south, of course, bordering with China, uh, North Korea is, is in there, um, but not part of the treaty, of course. Um, but it also includes the um, economic zones. And of course, if there are many uh, very busy uh, areas for shipping in that part of the world, including for military uh, vessels. Uh, so this is a rather controversial uh, treaty. Again, uh, nuclear weapon states have not yet respected it. Uh, now, my favorite treaty, the Treaty of Pelindava. Um, I'm not sure everyone is aware what the name of Pelindava means. It's a Zulu word, uh, meaning that the matter is now closed. It's also uh, the site of the where South Africa developed its highly enriched uranium and uh, continues to be a research, a nuclear research facility. Uh, the Nuclear Energy Commission of South Africa, NEXA, is based there. The picture on the top left is the picture of the facility. Uh, and this is where South Africa's, uh, the, the nuclear material for South Africa's nuclear weapons were developed. It's not where the actual weapons were developed. They were developed at a site not far from that. Um, but Pelindaba is symbolic um, to, given it's the meaning of the name, uh, that the, the matter of nuclear weapons is closed for Africa. Um, and of course, Africa being uh, a, a one uh, continent, uh, it is also very significant that the whole continent is nuclear weapon free. Um, very much came very much as a result. Uh, of the, the French tests in Algeria um, and also was spurred by the fact that South Africa uh, dismantled its nuclear weapons and acceded to the NPT in, in 91. The treaty was signed in Cairo. Uh, it was a deal actually between South Africa and Egypt um, and it entered into force on the 15th of July uh, 2009. The treaty is interesting that it prohibits nuclear weapons research and it, it also mandates program reversal, unlike any of the other treaties. Um, and that's a, the result of the South African program. So um, it can in fact be useful if one looks at the possible establishment of a zone in the Middle East, where a country such as Israel will have to dismantle its nuclear weapons without declaring that they have them, because Israel has never declared that they had nuclear weapons. So uh, the model for, of the Pelindawa Treaty is, is, a, is a good example of how it could be done. But very importantly, uh, the Pelindawa Treaty establishes the African Commission on Nuclear Energy. And we will have a, a very good talk by um, the Executive Secretary of, of the uh, AFCON uh, following mine. Also important, um, it pro pro prohibits any attack on nuclear facilities. Um, and that's extremely important. I mean, we have uh, um, in the group um, of participants, many uh, participants who work in at nuclear facilities or nuclear regulatory or, uh, facility, uh, organizations. And I'm sure you all agree that any attack on a nuclear facility is extremely dangerous for uh, the population. Um, there's controversy about the street. And this, this, now I come to the second part of my anti-colonial uh, uh, a little passion. Um, you'll notice on the map, and that's the official map used, uh, would be used for the negotiations of, of the treaty. And maybe I should just show you uh, what you see here. If I can get the screen 
is in fact um, probably one of the only <laughs> original texts of the treaty um, outside uh, the, the uh, African Union, the depository of the treaty was one of the copies that were not used when the treaty was signed in Cairo. Um, I was fortunate to, to hold on to it. Um, but in this, uh, it, there's a map, and this is the map. And it has this small little dot here uh, that says, this area appears without, uh, without the question of sovereignty. Uh, and that area refers to the Chagas Archipelago. Uh, Chagos Archipelago is part of Mauritius, and but the, the United Kingdom, when Mauritius became independent, uh, retained that island uh, and leased part of the island, one of the islands, the largest one, Diego Garcia, to the United States, and the United States built one of its largest uh, bases there. It's a forwardly deployed strategic air and uh, naval base. Uh, you see in the bottom, there are B-52s lined up, but there are as many as 20 B-52s, as well as uh, B-1s and B-2s based on that base. All those aircraft are strategic aircraft. They are designed to carry nuclear weapons. They are, of course, also used in the, uh, in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, but the the uh, atoll is, was dredged and is large enough to accommodate aircraft carriers as well as nuclear submarines. Um, very interesting that just in 2019, the International Court of Justice declared that uh, the UK's um, occupation of the island is illegal. And last year, the General Assembly adopted the resolution with majority support um, that uh, basically endorses the ICJ opinion. Uh, yet the United States and the United Kingdom uh, keep on to those islands. And in fact, in my view, it is a major Achilles heel in the treaty because it is part of the treaty. The territory is recognized by the African Union um, as part of the African uh, nuclear weapon free zone. Yet um, there are potentially nuclear weapons uh, on that part of the treaty. Um, the treaty has three protocols. The protocol requiring nuclear weapon states not to threaten or use nuclear weapons against African countries have been ratified by all the nuclear weapon states except uh, for the United States. Um, the third, second protocol that requires nuclear weapon states never to test on African territories have been ratified by all the uh, nuclear weapon states except the United States. It has a third protocol that has nothing to do with nuclear weapons, but is equally controversial. Again, I'm coming back to my peeve with colonial powers. Um, as you may know that there are um, small territories uh, in Morocco that, uh, that there's a dispute between Spain and Morocco over those territories. Um, one is not much larger than a very large rock. Um, these are Moroccan territories, um, and not only obviously are they um, claimed by Morocco, but they're also recognized by the African Union as Moroccan territory. Um, the protocol to this treaties requires states that have territorial claims of territories inside the zone to be to be um, at the negotiations and to be consulted, just like nuclear weapon states. They cannot block the negotiations, but they are consulted. Spain have consistently argued that they were not consulted. Well, I can tell you this, I sat next to the Spanish representative in Johannesburg when the la during the last um, negotiations of this treaty. So uh, that is bogus. Um, and so uh, just like the United Kingdom trying to come out of with on the Diego Garcia or the, the Archipelagos, Spain is also not respecting the territorial uh, sovereignty of 
uh, territories in the African continent. However, uh, this is not a nuclear issue. We don't uh, consider that Spain, a non-nuclear weapon state in good standing uh, without any nuclear weapons on its territory, um, will there's any intentions of abusing the, uh, the uh, character of the African nuclear weapon free zone. Right, moving on uh, to the Central Asian nuclear weapon free zone. Um, this was the youngest one uh, established by five Central Asian state, most uh, the, the, the most important part here, of course, is that Kazakhstan at Semipalantinsk was the area where um, uh, nuclear weapons uh, by the Soviet Union were tested. But this is a very forward looking zone um, and also requires no testing as a require or, or uh, adherence to the CTBT uh, and as to the IEA additional protocol as a requirement. Several new proposed zones have been. Uh, established, including uh, in the Middle East, which has not been successful, uh, even in South Asia, obviously the um, Indian and Pakistani tests uh, put a death nail in that. Um, the Middle East zone has been a long aspiration. Unfortunately, this too, in my view, has died, uh, and we will see if it will be revived uh, during the upcoming um, NPT uh, review conference. So, Moving to the CTBT. Um, the CTBT is uh, an international treaty. It bans all nuclear explosions uh, by anyone, anywhere. It is both a horizontal and vertical non-proliferation and disarmament measure, meaning that it prevents the spread of nuclear weapons, or contributes to preventing the spread of nuclear weapons to more countries, because every country that enters the nuclear weapons club have tested, um, but also to improve the quality of nuclear weapons uh, vertically. So it's therefore a very important step towards a world free of nuclear weapons. It, is, it has a very intrusive and non-discriminatory verification system, and I'll briefly touch upon it. And once it enters into force, it will have a on-site inspection capability, as well as consultation and confidence building. The treaty has been signed by 184 states, of which 168 have ratified, yet it has not yet entered into force. Um, it is uh, served by a preparatory commission. Um, it is preparatory in, in only in name. Uh, I worked for that organization for almost eight years. It is a fully fledged international organization. Uh, it has been in place um, for 23 years since the treaty has been signed, uh, and it is highly effective. Uh, the current executive secretary, Dr. Lassina Zerbo, um, is from Burkina Faso, uh, and Dr. Zerbo is a scientist par excellence. Um, he is a nuclear uh, is a, is a, um, physicist uh, and headed up the International Data Center, uh, which is the backbone of the organization before he became executive secretary. Um, so this is what we, uh, when I was in the CTBTO, we used to call the family family picture. So all the, the areas in green um, represent countries that have signed and ratified this, this treaty. Uh, the areas in blue are those who have ratif not ratified it yet. And then the areas in sort of a, a gray are those who have not yet signed. Um, the red squares are the countries that are required to ratify the treaty for it into into force. Um, those were countries listed by the IEA as having nuclear facilities, meaning uh, nuclear power plants or nuclear research reactors, um, and also being part of the conference and disarmament, which negotiated the treaty. Um, and that's where the big problem lies. Uh, I'm very proud that Africa, um, uh, with the exception of, of uh, a few countries, you can't see them all um, because the map is, uh, you know, some are very small, but notably Egypt has not ratified um, uh, and it has to for the treaty to enter into force. Uh, and I fear this may uh, take a long time because Egypt has pinned his, uh, pegged his ratification to that of Israel joining the NPT. Uh, we have South Sudan, which we hope uh, will will uh, accede to the to the treaty uh, or succeed to the treaty, I should rather say, 
uh, and also Somalia and, and a few uh, other, other countries. But overall, Africa, like Latin America, is taking the lead in the world uh, in, in making the world free of nuclear testing. This is the problem. So these are the countries that have not yet ratified and they basically holding the world hostage. Very briefly, uh, the elements of the verification regime. Uh, you have the monitoring system, I'll show you how that looks like. Then once the treaty enters into force, uh, there will be the opportunity to consult and clarify whether there was in fact a nuclear explosion. Um, South Africa, many African countries is a mining country. And if they detonate five kilometers below surface, a large explosion in a gold mine or a, uh, a coal mine, that sends off a seismic signal that is picked up by the system in Vienna. And not to be confused that this may have been a nuclear explosion, especially coming from a country that once had nuclear weapons, there's a system of, of consultation. So the South African authorities will inform the uh, organization that these were obviously mining related explosions. Once the treaty is in force, uh, the organization will also have the capability, in fact, they already have the technical capability to go into a country that is considered uh, under suspicion of, of having conducted a test to do a number of exercises there to prove conclusively that it, could, that it tested. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there are also uh, some confidence building measures. The picture on the right bottom corner is a picture of the operations room in the, uh, in the uh, organization where all the data uh, is, is linked and all the stations are linked and you can actually see uh, how the system works uh, on a 24 hour basis. This is the international monitoring system, the world's largest alarm system. Um, it it um, comprises of 337 facilities all over the world, of which uh, more than 300 have been completed. These include uh, primary station, uh, 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 seismic stations that uh, worry about the blue and difference between blue and green. Uh, so all those green and blue triangles and circles represent seismic stations that are uh, designed to detect underground, essentially underground nuclear explosions, but also pick up obviously earthquakes. Um, then the yellow um, stars and squares, these are hydroacoustic stations. Uh, they are hydrophones uh, designed to, to detect underwater explosions. Um, then there are infrasound stations. Um, they are there to detect uh, explosions in the atmosphere. And then radionuclide stations, the kind of salmon colored squares that are spread all over the world. And they are there to detect uh, radioactive uh, material that's released as a result of nuclear explosions. And then there are a number of laboratories spread all over the world where they analyze it, the samples from the radioactive, the radionuclide stations. Quickly, just to show what these look like. Uh, these are the, uh, the seismic stations, they obviously a variety of them. And I should also point out that these stations are built on the territory of states. They belong to the states. They are maintained by the CTBTO. They are paid by the CTBTO. And the um, managers and staff that work for these, um, that, that maintain these uh, stations are all nationals of the states that they are are located in and those are those people are also trained by the organization. These are the radionuclide and noble gas stations. You can see it's a very large, almost a vacuum uh, machine sucking the air in and then forcing it through a filter. Um, Hydroacoustic stations, these are very expensive stations to build and maintain. Uh, few years ago, one was destroyed uh, and it cost upwards of 22 million to, to replace it. Um, they are basically radio, uh, uh, micro, uh, hydrophones, so as you see in this picture, um, that um, is suspended at a certain depth and connected with a cable to a close by island or um, uh, beach where the, the actual um, station is, is based. And then finally, infrasound stations, they are placed in very quiet parts of the world. 
uh, to detect uh, sounds in the atmosphere. They're also so sensitive that they would uh, can detect um, large planes and they can even detect meteorites entering the Earth's atmosphere. This is all connected by satellite um, through the global communication infrastructure. And that uh, data um, is beamed to Vienna where it's analyzed by, by uh, computers as well as humans. Uh, but at the same time, it's been to national data centers. Every country has its own national data centers. And the treaty is very interesting in this regard, that it is not the CTBTO's job to determine whether a nuclear explosion took place. It can only be determined by the national data centers, the national authorities. Um, and that's why the training is so important. When I worked for the CTBTO, one of my primary uh, uh, responsibilities were to organize training um, uh, courses, very much like this, uh, where, where we trained uh, data analysts in, uh, in analyzing the data and interpreting it. Now, this is uh, events, seismic events that may be very clear. Uh, uh, there may be a number of, of nuclear physicists and, and, and physicists on, online here. Um, these are seismic events that were analyzed by the organization, by humans in the organization, throwing out um, events that were too deep to be possibly nuclear explosions. Uh, a earthquake that occurred at 300 miles deep can it's impossible for that to be an, uh, a nuclear explosion. Um, so all the dots that you see, um, that is, you know, and this was 2019, so I'm sure this is now 0 0.7 million already, uh, were analyzed, every single one of them. Um, and there are, amongst those, seven dots that were actual nuclear explosions, and those were in uh, North Korea. And they were found. Um, but what this actually, for scientists, what this is important is it shows, one, it shows the tectonic plates very clearly. Um, and there's a lot of information that scientists can be, and you will get a very interesting talk by a good friend of mine, Misrak Fasea, um, who works for the International Data Center later on in the course on these applications, uh, how the organization and states use applications designed primarily to detect nuclear tests but have other applications. I always jokingly say that this tells you where not to go on vacation and where not to buy property because of obviously the seismic activity. Um, Africa is actually quite, quite free. And the reason is, is that Africa is fairly stable uh, for as far as um, uh, seismic activity. In fact, one of the, one of the most powerful stations, seismic stations in, um, in the world is based in Niger. Uh, and that station picked up every nuclear test conducted by North Korea very, very clearly. And that's because it sits in an area that is uh, that doesn't have a lot of seismic activity. Um, just to show how uh, our effective the system is, these are all the tests detected by, um, by the system of, of North Korea, uh, making it very clear that it, those were in fact nuclear tests. And, because of the triangulation uh, of all the stations, uh, you, we were able to actually put this on, this is a Google map showing exactly where the, um, the explosions took place. Each of those circles represent one of the tests. And if you look closely, uh, then you will actually even see the tunnels that the North Koreans used for, for those tests. As I mentioned, the, um, once the treaty is in force, we will, have the capability of entering a country with the uh, agreement of a future executive council to do a number of tests to including drilling um, and uh, using of, of um, uh, earth penetrating radar to determine uh, conclusively that there was a test. Um, Mestrak will talk e extensively on the civil and scientific applications, but uh, very effective uh, also in tsunami warning um, and uh, assisting in, in detecting the hazards uh, for aircraft as a result of, uh, of explosions uh, of, um, uh, you know, um, 
the large <coughs> explosions that occurred as a result of activity, the seismic activity. It was also very, very instrumental in the radiation release of Fukushima. So to conclude, uh, the treaty is not in force, yet there are very a number of political opportunities to advance it. Some of you may have um, attended the VCDNP event this morning that featured the Article 14 conference uh, chairs, which includes Algeria. Uh, and uh, this is a political uh, tool to try and advance the entry into force of the treaty. Um, they've also established a CTBTO youth group. There were several of the CTBTO youth group at the event. Um, and uh, the picture to the right is the former UN Secretary General. He used to jokingly say that his last name is ban, ban the bomb. So um, ban, seat, ban um, testing. So he, uh, I like the current exec, uh, Secretary General are very, very strong supporters of the CTBTO. So um, just, just to come back to that slide, my view, and I have been criticized for saying this, and I, I don't mind saying it, is that eight states in the world are holding up the security uh, of 168 others. Um, and so it is time for the world, but African states in particular, to put pressure on those states that have not yet ratified. Um, because as President Clinton uh, said, uh, when the treaty was signed, and he was the first head of state to sign it in 96, this was the longest battle fought. And because it took so long for a treaty to be uh, created, um, the battle is not over yet. Um, and so it is time for that to be done. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope I probably did go over time, but um, I would be pleased later on to answer any questions. And yeah, yeah, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was the last country to to ratify the treaty in 2019. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Actually, can everyone hear me, first of all? Yes. yes. When I first met Jean Dupre, it was in Vienna, and he was giving a talk as a representative from the CTBTO. And he walks in this room, looks around, he looks at me and he's like, are you the lady from Zimbabwe? And I was like, yes. And he's like, why haven't you ratified the CTBT? And I was like, ah. So yes, he's very passionate about this topic. Monsieur Moussaoud, vous avez la parole. Merci bien. Uh, et bonsoir. Uh, bonjour, bonjour. Bonsoir à tout le monde. Good evening and uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity given to, uh, to AFCON to present um, the implementation, in fact, of the Pelindaba Treaty. It's always difficult really to, uh, to follow uh, Mr. Jean Dupre's presentations. It's a challenge, in fact taking into account his passion and uh, his experience uh, on the Pelindaba Treaty and on the CTBTO. But we will try to present things differently, in particular in uh, the implementation side of this uh, the uh, treaty provision. Is it okay? Yes. Well, um, uh, I, uh, I, will I, I begin in fact, just by reminding very briefly what uh, uh, John uh, already said, the decision uh, of the uh, Organization of the African Union in 64, the, uh, the, the signature in 96 in Cairo of the treaty and the entry into force in 15 July 2009. Uh, uh, the organization in November 2010 of the first conference of state parties and the, the first meeting in May 2011 of the African Commission on Nuclear Energy. Uh, the current situation, we are 52 countries 
member states of the African Union, and 42 countries ratified the treaty. Um, is just a, a, a picture uh, from the first um, uh, first uh, conference of state parties. And as uh, presented already by uh, Mr. John Duprez, uh, we are the largest nuclear weapon free zones with the, uh, the 52 signatories and 42 state parties. It's important in the treaty uh, and in our uh, priorities to collaborate with other nuclear weapon free zones. It's important to collaborate uh, internationally and regionally against uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, our mandate is also to assist in the setting up of the Middle East, even if uh, John consider somewhere it's uh, a dream caput. Uh, we still believe and we need to be optimistic about uh, the global efforts to create this zone. Uh, our mandate is also, and it's, this is very important for the African uh, countries uh, to develop peaceful use of atomic energy. I will try to be uh, brief on this uh, aspect, focusing more on safety, security, and safeguards. The treaty contains 80, um, 22 articles. Nine, nine articles define the state party's obligations. Eight are on safety, security, and safeguards. And the Article 8 uh, uh, is related to peaceful nuclear uh, activities. Sorry. Uh, this Article 8 is very important. Um, it explicitly mentioned the IEA um, assistant or cooperation and the AFRA agreement as a technical arm for AFCON in order to implement uh, the peaceful uh, use of nuclear energy in Africa. Of course, this article includes the safety and security and safeguards programs undertaken by the IEA and, uh, and AFRA. Um, well, uh, this is uh, the Article 12, which uh, define the, the mandate of the African Commission on Nuclear Energy collating the reports, exchanging information, uh, reviewing the application to peaceful nuclear ac activities of safeguards by the IEA as elaborated in the Annex 3 and encouraging regional and sub-regional program uh, for cooperation in the peaceful use of nuclear science. Of course, promoting international cooperation with extra-zonal uh, state for uh, this uh, peaceful use. Uh, sorry. The AFCON vision is, uh, is uh, really coherent. We tried, in fact, uh, to put it coherent with the uh, vision of the African Union. As said before, uh, the African Union uh, commission is the depository of the treaty and uh, by um, uh, in fact uh, the uh, the uh, till now all the four uh, previous conference of state parties have been organized in Addis Ababa in the headquarters of the African Union Commission and we tried in 2020 to organize the fifth conference of state parties uh, in South Africa, uh, where the, uh, the headquarters of the AFCON uh, is uh, set up. Uh, our program of work is based on covering, in fact, the three pillars, compliance and safeguards with disarmament, verification and safeguards, the pillar two, safety and security with radiation and nuclear safety, including nuclear security, and uh, of course the pillar three, the promotional nuclear science and technology uh, in human health, water and environment, food and agriculture, energy, etc. The cross-cutting programs to these thematic areas are uh, education and training, and research and development in nuclear science and technology. 
the provision of the Pelindaba Treaty and uh, AFCON mandate um, priorities, in fact, considered by the AFCON are uh, uh, the, the most pressing needs for the state parties. In particular, as I said before, peaceful nuclear applications, considering the main uh, challenges uh, met by the African countries in all the fields, um, including the radioactive waste management for uh, environmental issues, and of course, the prerequisites related to safety, security, and safeguards. Capacity building in Africa, we uh, decided in fact to establish a critical mass of specialized teams and African experts in each of the fields uh, of activities related to the provision of the Perindaba Treaty. Of course, as already uh, decided by the AFRA agreement since 90, uh, make full use of the infrastructure in place uh, available in Africa regarding uh, related to re nuclear research centers, institute, universities, agencies, commissions, etc. cetera. But um, raising or selecting the recognized one uh, for their excellence in their field of uh, uh, activities. Uh, of course, we need to optimally uh, uh, to uh, optimally cooperate at the regional and international level in order to uh, uh, to um, reach the, the the needed synergy and uh, get the support from um, the providers of nuclear science and technology. This is uh, briefly the organization. The Conference of State Parties is the highest uh, decision level organ, AFCON with 12 commissioners um, uh, identified or uh, selected or designated by the uh, 12, uh, 12 uh, state parties uh, elected during the Conference of State Parties. The AFCON Bureau with uh, the chair, the vice chair, and the executive secretary, a very small Afghan secretariat till now has decided by the conference of state party to, uh, to uh, optimize the resources in the short and the midterm um, agenda, but uh, largest one, uh, in fact, in the uh, long, -term, uh, long term agenda. Of course, we will build our activities on specialized teams uh, from Africa and uh, regional resource centers or collaborating centers. Uh, everybody need, know very well, in fact, the, um, all the challenges we are uh, facing in Africa, considering 33 out of 47 less developed countries uh, are in Africa, 70% in fact, uh, food insecurity, uh, hungry, uh, uh, lack of radiotherapy centers, 80% of African, Africans don't have access to radiotherapy, according to the IEA last reports. The evolution of cancer in Africa uh, and in this worrying increase and the uh, don't access to clean and safe water. And the last but not the least, uh, the number of African citizens without access to electricity. We observed, in fact, even in our, uh, uh, during our uh, AFRA mandate uh, from 90 to, uh, 20, uh, to, to, to 2018, that all, uh, not all the African countries are ready, fully ready to benefit from nuclear science and technology due to the priorities in uh, these countries. These are the programs uh, related to peaceful use of nuclear energy in health, industry, food, agri and agriculture, water resources, energy, of course, and the, uh, the prerequisites, as I said, related to safety, security, and safeguards. Last December, in December, in fact, 2019, 
AFCON participate to the uh, African Union Specialized Technical Committee experts and uh, ministerial meeting on education, science and technology. And this meeting uh, adopted, in fact, uh, uh, a re the expert report and uh, a declaration uh, requesting the African Commission on Nuclear Energy and the African Union strategic partners in collaboration with the International Atomic Energy Agency to develop the Nuclear Science and Technology Research and Development Program, undertake capacity building, education, and training in nuclear science and technology for the safe and secure use of nuclear energy. Uh, of course, when we speak about safety, security, and safeguards, we uh, immediately think about uh, nuclear centers and nuclear research reactors, nuclear power plants, etc. The situation is as follows. We have 10 uh, nuclear research reactors uh, in Africa. The, the, the majority are operational. Some, are, um, some countries are trying to reactivate uh, or to restart. In fact, this is the case in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Some others are uh, under upgrading programs. This, uh, these uh, nuclear facilities are used for education and training in nuclear science and technology in general, but in nuclear engineering, including safety, uh, nuclear safety and neutron applications. Uh, the IEA uh, through uh, the uh, support through the AFRA program since 95, um, this network of uh, uh, African countries in order to strengthen the capacities of research reactors for safety and utilization. Of course, regional conferences have been organized in conjunction uh, with each project coordination meeting, presenting the, the research results uh, achieved by the teams, by these teams, and the IEA established a regional advisory safety committee for research reactors in Africa, RASCA, related uh, uh, to uh, the development of nuclear safety uh, around uh, these nuclear facilities. Of course, we are uh, facing, still facing uh, challenges in several countries related to strategic planning, development of business plan, optimal utilization of these uh, facilities, sustainability of the programs, maintenance issues, human resource development, and training and qualifications of nuclear research reactors operators. Of course, ownership in nuclear safety assessment, legislation, and regulations. We are trying from, uh, we started in, in fact in AFRA, but we are uh, boosting this program um, from AFCON to develop, uh, uh, to set up the equivalent network of particle accelerator uh, countries, uh, particle accelerators in Africa, with the five countries, starting by South Africa with Ethiopia Labs and Nexa, etc., cetera, um, Egypt, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and Algeria. We plan to organize a side event last April 2020, but this uh, important uh, first uh, meeting of the network has been postponed due to COVID-19. Uh, just few words on uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, power in Africa. Uh, as said by the DDG, uh, the IEA DDG, Africa is hungry for energy. And more or less 12 uh, African countries are interested uh, to develop uh, or to integrate nuclear power in their energy mix, uh, starting uh, with a cooperation project with the IEA and um, trying also to create a regional and African network uh, on uh, countries involved in uh, nuclear uh, power planning or nuclear power infrastructure. 
Uranium mining, uh, Africa is uh, providing more or less 20% of the uranium uh, to the world. Um, and this is also uh, a field of activity which, uh, which needs to be followed and to be uh, managed um, coherently, uh, including uh, by the African Union Commission uh, due to the environmental issues and due to uh, the trade, uh, the, the uh, African Union trade uh, policy and uh, uh, regulations. Uh, always uh, on nuclear power uh, energy program and interest in Africa, this is the 19 milestones developed by uh, the IEA and 10 uh, of these 19 milestones are related to, uh, to uh, safety, security, and safeguards. This is just a reminder, in fact, of the importance of nuclear safety and safeguards in implementing uh, peaceful use of nuclear energy. And we will, um, I will um, start now uh, the presentation of our uh, program of work, our objectives, and uh, our uh, activities started or launched since mainly the last conference of state parties, parties in March 2018. Uh, of course, as I said before, the optimal synergy and the maximum cooperation with all the regional and international partners in order to uh, consider the convergence of objective, the complementarity of activities avoiding duplications between uh, AFCON, the IEA, AFRA, FNRBA, and other uh, African networks uh, like uh, the AFRA NEST for education and training or this uh, network on nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear power uh, infrastructure. Of course, we need really to optimize our human and financial resources to, uh, to um, to succeed in our programs. This is just a few slides reminding the, the need to, uh, to uh, converge and to, to work together with AFRA, with FNRBA, with the support of uh, the IEA, which is supporting, in fact, Africa since more than uh, 60 years and uh, representing the main uh, the main um, uh, partners for Africa for the peaceful use, but also uh, mandated by the Pelindaba Treaty to, um, to implement the, uh, the uh, nuclear safeguards uh, in Africa. At the operational level, the African uh, Regional Cooperative Agreement for Research, Development and Training related to nuclear science and technology started or uh, operational since 90, April 90, is relevant with the Article 8 of the Pelindaba Treaty. On the regulatory side, the FNRBA, uh, which is the forum uh, of, of the regulatory, uh, of national regulatory body in Africa, um, set up in 2009 uh, by the IEA, is also uh, relevant with the Article 7, 8, and 10 of the Pelindaba Treaty. Of course, at the international level, as I said, uh, the uh, IEA, with, with its technical cooperation program, uh, in particular, the division in charge of Africa, is uh, assisting uh, every uh, member state, African Union member state, uh, um, member of the IEA, uh, in developing this peaceful use and supporting their uh, their safety and security uh, programs. Well, uh, some activities uh, we developed since 2019 related to safety, security, and, and uh, safeguards. We uh, participate in April 2019 in uh, as a first participation, in fact, of Afcon to the uh, ministerial meeting related to uh, uh, to infrastructure and energy. And this meeting decided to include in its report uh, the, uh, the decision to consider or the recommendation 
to the African uh, countries uh, to consider nuclear power in their energy mix strategy. We participated also to, do, to the uh, last uh, three general uh, IEA general conference, and we called to um, the plenary and all the uh, African Union member states to ratify the Pelindaba Treaty and uh, the uh, involved parties to ratify the three pro protocols. I don't mention the details. Uh, Mr. Duprez uh, gave these details on the Pelindaba Treaty slide previously. Of course, uh, the uh, strengthening of the regional and international cooperation in safe and secure peaceful use of nuclear energy, energy is also has been also reminded and we reminded and we call uh, we call to develop all the international efforts to the creation of the nuclear weapon free zones in the middle east uh, we also as i said before participated to this ministerial meeting uh, on education science and technology with this uh, important uh, declaration uh, adopted by this meeting and by the eu uh, summit in 2020. Um, we contributed to the International Conference on Nuclear Secu Security in February 2020 and participate to the uh, meeting organized by the IEA uh, to coordinate uh, AFCON, IEA, AFRA and FNRBA programs. And we decided in fact during this meeting to uh, sign a quadripartite memorandum uh, of understanding or uh, a cooperation agreement but there is still some challenges related to the legal mandate of each uh, each partner um, considering afcon as a treaty body iea as a, an international organization afra as an agreement and fnrb as a forum uh, well but we uh, we are um, we are uh, committed in fact to go ahead and to work together and to consider how to formalize this partnership. We organized with uh, support of Canada and the organization uh, by Wilton Park UK a conference last February uh, in preparation to the NPT review conference. Uh, the, the, the title was uh, in support of Africa Agenda 2063 pathways forward for expanding peaceful use of nuclear energy and uh, nuclear uh, technology in Africa. So AFCON is also considering in its strategic plan 2021-2025, the outlining who is doing what uh, in safe uh, to, uh, to implement safe and secure peaceful use uh, of nuclear energy in Africa and uh, with, uh, of course, uh, all the stakeholders. We organized since last August 2020 several virtual meetings, one in uranium in Africa and opportunities for interregional cooperation, contribution of women in nuclear uh, to socioeconomic development in Africa, nuclear safeguards in Africa, and uh, partnership with, uh, of course, the IEA, but also the European Union through ISARDA, the ISTC, the International Science and Technology Center based in Nur Sultan and uh, other, uh, other partners. Uh, INSEP for uh, INSEP and NSA from USA, for example. A nuclear power in Africa, programs, prospects and safety and security requirements. These are some slides which will give you a flavor on our uh, consultations since only two years uh, with the, the office of the uh, African Union Commission chairperson, with the Commissioner uh, Peace and Security, with the Commissioner Education, uh, Human Resources, Science and Technology, with the Director of Social Affairs, and uh, participating to the meeting, the coordinating meeting uh, coordination meeting of the specialized agencies of the African Union. We uh, started also uh, an annual briefing since 2018 of the African Union Peace and Security Council on the implementation of the Penindaba Treaty. 
um, we uh, in fact uh, brief the 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 the, uh, the council on the progress made in the implementation of the treaty, the main nuclear applications program under application under implementation, the Afghan strategy and program, and some recommendations in preparations to the prep uh, This is the last uh, the last um, 2019 uh, briefing meeting, including with the participation of ICANN uh, to this meeting and some uh, important recommendation uh, conclusions and resolutions by this uh, council supporting Afghan. Uh, with the IEA, we are following uh, the uh, implementation of this uh, uh, INSP uh, 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 activities in Africa. In fact, um, till January 2015, 45 uh, African uh, states uh, approved, finalized, or drafted this uh, integrated uh, nuclear safety and security uh, uh, programs. Um, this is very important. Uh, the support from the IEA is important to the state parties. And we are, in fact, uh, encouraging all the African Union uh, member states to, uh, to go ahead with uh, this, uh, these programs and projects. Uh, with the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs, we started, in fact, by uh, compiling and reviewing the UN 1540 reports uh, forwarded by all the African state parties in addition to the annual uh, national reports uh, shared by uh, the state parties to, uh, with Afghan. Uh, we are also considering uh, organize the organization of joint events, including regional events with uh, UN Office of Government Affairs. And we participated to some of these uh, events organized uh, in uh, August 2019 to the very important seminar uh, on fostering cooperation and enhancing consultation mechanism among the existing nuclear weapon free zones on August uh, 2019 to the regional meeting organized in Addis Ababa um, uh, in preparation to the NPT review conference and uh, last July 2020 to the informal virtual workshop on good practices and lessons learned with respect to the nuclear weapon free zones. With the United Nations Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament in Africa, we uh, have a strong commitment, in fact, to cooperate together, but we, uh, we still uh, need to boost uh, our, um, our agenda in order to start uh, joint uh, activities in, in Africa. This is uh, the workshop organized in May 2019 on uh, the treaty official material uh, uh, treaty. Uh, this is um, at the left, the meeting organized in Addis Ababa by uh, including with uh, the, the current IEA director general, which was uh, at that time um, designated as the chair of the NPT review conference and uh, with director um, at the right, the director of UN Office of Development Affairs. Uh, this is the last uh, meeting we, uh, we, uh, in which we participate with, uh, of course, uh, moderated by Mr. Duprez in Bangkok in uh, December, 2019, uh, discussing uh, possible ways to advance ne negotiation of the treaty banning the production of fissile materials for nuclear weapons. Uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the international cooperation, uh, we started with uh, the IEA, in fact, by signing this, practic uh, this uh, practical arrangement in uh, September 2019 and discussing with all the departments on the, uh, on the plan of action, uh, including in safety, security, and uh, safeguards. 
This is some pictures of the Wilton Park uh, and Canada Global Affairs uh, and AFCON conference organized in February 2020 in South Africa. Um, this is some, uh, uh, in fact, information about the interest, strong interest of the African countries to uh, the uh, nuclear power uh, program. Uh, including, uh, of course, this slide, which raise, raises the uh, the advanced one, the only nuclear uh, uh, power plant in Africa is in Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, South Africa is considering uh, a new uh, build in the next uh, few years, and the Egyptian uh, or, or already a launched program, nuclear uh, power plant, plant program. Um, with um, the support of the, uh, with Rosatom, of course, but with the support of the International Atomic Energy Agency through uh, uh, in-air missions. The other countries, uh, Algeria, Ghana, Kenya, Morocco, Namibia, Nigeria, Senegal, Sudan, Tunisia, and Uganda are considering at different stages uh, of uh, this nuclear power program or infrastructure uh, they are at different stage of uh, programs development. Some are more advanced. I uh, just mentioned uh, Nigeria and uh, Ghana in particular. Maybe uh, the, uh, the newcomer Zambia is also uh, starting with nuclear research centers. This is a reminder of uh, the importance given by the, uh, allocated by the AFCON to the uh, regulatory uh, side and the, the safety uh, and security aspects in developing uh, nuclear, uh, peaceful use of nuclear energy in Africa. And this is in fact, the, uh, what uh, in September, 2020 declared the IEA Director General Ambassador Grossi. Uh, last uh, 1st December, uh, AFCON participated to the subcommittee uh, uh, of the Specialized Technical Committee on Energy uh, and uh, adopted the declaration welcoming the progress achieved by the member states in Africa in the field of peaceful use and uh, called for strengthening the cooperation between the AFCON, the International Atomic Energy Agency and other AU strategic partners in the development of safe and secure peaceful nuclear uh, programs in Af Africa. The expert meeting encouraged uh, AFCON and IEA to um, fully integrate AFRA and FNRBA programs uh, in, in this uh, 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 continental uh, agenda. Uh, this is the, uh, in fact, the, the uh, webinar we organized with the IEA and uh, other partners, including uh, and um, uh, African member states, including uh, South Africa, uh, through the NNR and through uh, the, uh, the, the chair of the uh, board of NEXA, uh, Ghana Atomic Energy, uh, uh, Energy Commission, uh, Rosatom representatives, and of course, the IEA, uh, DDG, and uh, nuclear infrastructure section. This is uh, the, the webinar on uh, uranium uh, with Kazakhstan. Uh, as uh, I said before, uh, Africa and Kazakhstan are providing more or less 34% of the uh, uranium to the world. And it's really important to consider uh, this interregional uh, cooperation with not only Kazakhstan, but only uh, all, all the Central Asian uh, nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, we are also allocating a great uh, importance to health uh, and to fighting cancer in Africa, uh, considering the, uh, uh, the uh, critical, and uh, really uh, worrying situation uh, in Africa. Um, these are some activities we launched in uh, safety and security uh, and safeguards with the IEA, with ESARDA, STC, and uh, INSEP uh, uh, in Algiers or in, uh, in Vienna. 
uh, start, starting by organizing joint events in this field. This is the side event uh, to the ICONS organized by ISTC with the Vienna Center uh, Disarmament and Non-Proliferation uh, in, based in Vienna on safety, security, and safeguards in Africa. Um, this is uh, the webinar we organized in uh, nuclear safeguards uh, last 23 uh, of November with the IEA, but also with uh, INSEP, ISARDA, and ISTC. Uh, we are planning to organize a regional uh, workshop, high-level workshop in radioactive wastes with uh, experts and ministers um, uh, in charge of environmental issues uh, in Africa, of course, with the African Union uh, Commission Department in charge of these environmental issues in order to uh, include in all the African Union uh, um, programs and agendas, the nuclear uh, issues in including uh, with uh, in uh, during the discussions and the the uh, uh, summits or uh, symposium or forums with uh, the AU strategic partners. Um, I will uh, skip I, maybe one word or one minute on this. In addition to the AFRA regional designated centers, which are considered as centers of excellence in different fields of activities, uh, we are um, we make we made a call last June and uh, August to uh, identify regional collaborating uh, centers in two fields which are not covered: nuclear safeguards and nuclear safety and security. Uh, um, we uh, all already uh, identified the selection committees and are uh, uh, reviewing. Uh, we are reviewing the uh, the proposal in order to select uh, and maybe to audit these uh, centers of excellence in nuclear safety and se security. Um, as I said before, Afcon is based in Pretoria in Africa, in South Africa. And according to the host agreement signed with uh, um, the African Union Commission or between the African Union Commission and the government of Re Republic of South Africa, we have the following missions uh, as a treaty body and as a specialized agency to promote and follow up and support from Africa, not only from Vienna, the continental programs in all the fields of activity in nuclear science and technology and AFCON Secretariat based in Africa should be considered as in the field management unit for AFRA and FNRBA. Uh, and we are committed in fact, as a secretariat to support AFRA and FNRBA and all the operational African uh, re recognized network in nuclear science technology through our communication and the resource mobilization strategies and uh, in particular with the African Union strategic partners and the, the parties to the protocols. This is uh, uh, some figures showing our uh, efforts to coordinate with AFRA, TC Africa, Professor Shaukat here, uh, Nuclear Safety and Security, the chair of the FNRBA, and uh, including uh, at the in the bottom, our meeting uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Najat Mukhtar, which is the DDG Nuclear uh, Science and Technology in Vienna. The last meeting we organized virtually with TC Africa, with AFRA representatives, with the FNRBA chair, and with three commissioners uh, um, was in fact in, um, organized from 24 November to 7 December. And we reviewed the draft strategic plan of AFCON and the uh, flagship programs in um, peaceful use of nuclear energy, but also in safety uh, and security. Uh, we are committed to uh, better serve the development in the continent with uh, the support of this regional organization, but also with the African Young Generation in Nuclear, with the Women in Nuclear Africa organization, and the other 
uh, organi institutions delivering education and uh, training in nuclear science. This is uh, the last uh, African uh, Youth Summit organized in October 2019 in South Africa. And our contribution to this uh, summit and our commitment to support uh, this uh, organization. This is uh, our meetings with the women in nuclear, followed by, uh, of course, consultation uh, at the AFCON premises. And sorry, this is the webinar we organized on 26 uh, of November with the women in nuclear. And uh, we invited, in fact, uh, very high level uh, experts and uh, representative from UN uh, Office of Disarmament Affairs or from the IEA in order to uh, support this organization and to raise, to promote the contribution of women in the development of socio, uh, socio-economic development of Africa. Uh, we are preparing with INSEP and NSA USA uh, an, a webinar on the African woman contribution to nuclear safeguard, specifically uh, in nuclear safeguard. Um, the, this is just, uh, in fact, uh, uh, a conclusion in addition to the agreement signed with the IEA, Zarda, and ISTC. We signed last September uh, a memorandum of understanding with Rosatom, which represents Russia. Uh, and uh, G, uh, Department of Atomic Energy India, uh, which represents India, memorandum also signed in September 2020. And we are preparing, uh, in fact, we are consulting uh, the Central Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zones and OPANAL, and we are um, optimistic to sign very soon in 2021, two memorandum or two uh, cooperation agreement with these nuclear weapon free zones as uh, decided by the Nur Sultan uh, coordination meeting organized by UN Office of Disarmament Affairs. And we really uh, uh, believe on uh, the uh, strengthening on the nuclear weapon free zones uh, in order to contribute from Africa uh, to the global uh, disarmament and non-proliferation uh, uh, global uh, issues. Uh, these are just some uh, signing ceremonies. And we also, uh, as AFCON, participated as the first action with Russia to the uh, uh, AFCON, uh, to the uh, Russia uh, Africa uh, Nuclear Education uh, Forum for Sustainable Development. And we recalled, in fact, the challenges faced in Africa, uh, including the adequate development of human resources in nuclear science and technology for safety, security, and safeguards, of course, also based on a long-term vision and uh, sustainable programs. These are uh, just a presentation of what um, uh, some consultations with the Central Asia uh, nuclear weapon free zone through Kazakhstan uh, embassy in Pretoria and uh, with uh, the Latin American Caribbean nuclear weapon free zone through uh, the Peruvian embassy in Vienna or with the Mexican ambassador uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Nur Sultan. This is the joint, uh, recent joint communique uh, released by uh, OPANAL with AFCON uh, at the occasion of the entry into force of the Treaty of the Pro Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, we also, as AFCON, participated as an observer to the first uh, meeting of state parties to the South Pacific Nuclear Free, Free Zone Treaty invited by, the, uh, of course, the organizers. Uh, we are trying also to remind to the African Union, uh, African Union member states, but also to the international uh, community, our commitment uh, uh, related to uh, disarmament and non-proliferation through press statement and communique, uh, including the one in August with the CTVT. In conclusions, our outlooks are as follow. Uh, 
implementing the 2025-2025 strategic plan with the long-term vision, uh, of course, according to the AU agenda 2063, integrating the safe and secure peaceful use, uh, peaceful nuclear applications program, efficient implementation of the AFCON midterm program, the three pillars, strengthening the cooperation and the coordination with the nuclear weapon free zones, in particular, uh, in the next uh, conferences, the conference of the nuclear weapon free zones planned in July 2021, and the NPT review conference planned in August, uh, and uh, maybe with the IEA and other partners during the general conference in September, and further development of the international partnership and cooperation programs, in particular with the provider of nuclear science and technology. I thank you for your attention and sorry for the time. Thank you. Thank very, you. Thank, you very, thank you very much, Mr. Masood. If we could stop the screen share and maybe have Jean come on camera as well so that we can get to the question and answer. Due to a shortage of time, we will be consolidating these questions so that Jean and Mr. Masood can answer as many as possible. I think everyone has gotten a very good understanding that even though Africa does not possess nuclear weapons, we are very active on the continent in terms of trying to keep <laughs> Africa nuclear weapons free and also to help with the peaceful uses pillar of the NPT in terms of harnessing nuclear power for our own purposes. Jean, I have a few questions here for you, which I have consolidated, and they, I think, would be in reference to the CTBT. So there was a question about cleanup measures on the testing sites around the world. What, if any, have there have been done? And then there was questions to do with financing of the nuclear test alarm systems and whether or not radiation detectors have been placed at monitoring stations that detect nuclear explosions. And before you answer those, I would like to um, highlight, there was a question about Annex 1 and Annex 2 countries of the CTBT. What is the difference and what are the enforcement measures at the CTBTO's disposal for those who either fail to comply, adhere to the treaty or sign on if they're holding everything back? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, let me uh, thank uh, Ms. Hamid for his uh, very interesting presentation and congratulate him uh, for the wonderful work that AFCON is doing. Uh, I, I had something to do uh, with setting up AFCON. I was, in fact, at the very first uh, meeting uh, where the, <coughs> the commission was established in, in Addis Ababa. Um, and I'm very proud uh, that uh, that has gone so far. I mean, it's, just, it's been an organization long in the making, and you've certainly taken it on uh, and, and representing uh, the work of, of the commission very well. So thank you and congratulations. Um, Please, I, thank uh, you. Um, to, to respond to some of the questions, and there are many, uh, let me be very, try to be very brief. Um, the um, Annex 1 are all the, all the states that are capable, can sign the treaty. Um, and so you will find it's interesting that there are states there that are not recognized by the United Nations um, as, as, uh, as members of the UN. Or, and so that is very specific uh, given the impact of nuclear testing, especially in the South Pacific on small island states. Um, Annex 2 uh, lists the countries that in 1996 possessed nuclear research reactors or nuclear energy reactors, and that were also members of the conference and disarmament that negotiated the treaty. And those were considered to be nuclear capable states. 
Um, and for that reason, it was considered uh, important that all those countries must ratify the treaty for it to enter into force. I can spend many, many more minutes to explain why I think that was a mistake, but that is how the treaty was designed. And so we have eight of those uh, remaining. Um, then there was a, a, a very interesting question uh, and a very important question, a very informed question, I must say, uh, by someone about the um, the dome, the cleanup, and I, and I want to address the cleanup question with this. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly um, share my, share the screen here because uh, it's an image is much better. So uh, Dom, help me out, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, so um, the Marshall Islands, the Bikini Atoll uh, was the target of several US tests in fact, um, one of the largest US tests conducted ever was a 50 megaton, megaton, not kiloton, megaton test that uh, ripped that island apart. Um, and uh, the radio fallout uh, severely impacted on most of the, of the uh, Pacific Island populations. Um, and after the US concluded its testing there, it used one of the craters uh, as a dump site. So it put all the materials, fluids, um, and, and dirt, um, uh, including plutonium that they had US soldiers pick up from the beaches uh, into that crater and filled it up with a, a dome and um, so that it would not leak. Uh, well, uh, it is leaking. It has been leaking for years. And as a result of global warming, the water levels are rising and that dome may soon be underwater. Um, and so the US have been uh, pressured to decontaminate the site. They've started to do that. Um, and in fact, there was a, a, a tribunal um, that recognized the rights of the people of the Marshall Islands. Um, and even in 20, up until 2019, the United States uh, argued that uh, it, it was not very transparent in what happened there. Uh, in 2019, they actually admitted that they withheld uh, information. In fact, the radioactivity at that particular area is higher than it is at the very heart of Chernobyl. Um, and so Negotiations were supposed to start between uh, the Marshall Islands and the United States, but uh, we know with the tr former Trump administration, uh, uh, they were simply not interested in it. But to the broader issue, um, in there, there's actually, in my view, very little has been done to clean up. Um, Mr. Wood can speak about Algeria, but uh, the French government has, has taken some steps, but definitely not adequate. Um, I have seen uh, pictures uh, and have, have been to actually the test site, uh, uh, the former test site there, uh, and it's, it's widely open. Anyone can walk around there. Um, and in Kazakhstan, where uh, there were almost a thousand tests conducted by the Soviet Union, very little has been done to clean up by, this, by Russia. There's been a lot of work being done by um, Kazakhstan also with support of the United States to clean that up. So um, moving on to, let me stop the screen share here uh, briefly. Um, moving on to some of the other questions and, uh, and I will then stop to give uh, Ms. Ahut some time. Um, there's, a, there's a question here, uh, who finance the stations? Uh, the states parties do, or the signatory states uh, by their contributions. Uh, so every state is assessed based on its GDP, just like the United Nations uh, assessment. And so the United States pays 22.5% of the budget um, and other countries obviously less. Um, and so that money is part of the budget. The budget is about $120 million a year. And most of that is earmarked to the establishment and the maintenance of the stations and the training of personnel. Um, but as I mentioned, while the CTBTO builds the stations, the stations actually belong to the, the station, the, na the, the nations on which, where, the where the stations are located. Um, are there radiation detectors also in place in those stations that detect? Yes, um, the radiation detectors, there are two types. It's a radionuclide detector 
Um, but then the other one is, um, uh, so the radionuclide detect, obviously detect particulates, uh, but the other one is a xenon station. Um, so the xenon station, uh, xenon gas is, is very specific to nuclear explosions. In fact, the only other time that xenon gas is released is when they, are, they produce millennium 99 or nuclear medicine. Um, and so, but uh, you can deduct from that question, and I, I'm sure that's where the, the, the person who asked it is thinking, um, can you detect with those stations potential um, enrichment of uranium? Uh, this is an interesting debate that is, that is going on. Uh, they're not designed to do so, but it doesn't mean that they cannot be equipped with, 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 uh, with equipment. Um, what are the enforcement measures? Uh, the, the enforcement measures, once the treaty is enforced though, uh, the Executive Council uh, will meet within four days after, um, well, will meet and within four days after a, uh, an allegation has been made must decide whether to exercise an on-site inspection. The on-site inspection will then use all the tools that it has at its disposal, and those are numerous, to report back to the council what the findings were. And then the council will decide with a uh, majority vote whether that was in fact an explosion and refer the matter to the Security Council. Just like the Board of Governors would refer a, um, a a country that is in non-compliance with the safeguards agreement to the Security Council. Um, what's the role of the CTBT in the NPT? Um, the the uh, obviously being a major pillar of the nuclear non-proliferation regime, the CTBT is represented at the review conference. The executive secretary typically uh, makes a statement. Uh, and staff of the CTBT goes to the conference, but I must say uh, it has been treated as the as bit of the um, the ugly duckling, if I may say, for many years, just because many countries believe that while the organization is not entered into force and therefore it is not fully fledged, cannot sit at the same table as the IEA, uh, which uh, which I believe is, is, is wrong. Um, I think, Nomsa, I think I Briefly answered any questions? I, uh, yes, I uh, think you did. Time for as well. Uh, yes, I think you did. Uh, maybe the last one would be on the nuclear testing numbers that were provided in your presentation. Are these numbers verified, like, do, or could there possibly be more or less? How do we know that the numbers are accurate for the testing? Oh, the, yeah, the numbers are actually, um, with the exception of of one, um, the numbers are quite accurate and and. What's the interesting thing is, of course, most of these tests took place long before the CTBT uh, system was in place. Um, and so the, the, um, the United States and the Soviet Union uh, built their own verification systems uh, to spy on each other to make sure that they will. So those numbers come from, from that, but also, um, believe it or not, but all the countries that have tested have announced the test. They have, because this was, one of the one of the things about nuclear testing, other than testing the the, the yield, testing the um, the effectiveness and the military application, that's the reason why countries test. There's a political reason for testing. It sends political messaging, and so countries, you know, when India tested, uh, there were there were parades in the streets of New Delhi. Um, people were jubilant about it. Um, uh, France was ex extremely uh, proud that it tested in Algeria. I don't think the Algerians were that happy about it. Um, but so, but they all announced those tests. And so um, th th those figures are correct. The one exception is that there is increasingly more evidence that Israel may have tested in 1979, um, but there's no concrete evidence to that. Israel is a nuclear weapon state, although not uh, part of the NPT. Uh, but it's the only one who has not tested. Um, all the other states with nuclear weapons uh, tested. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, Monsieur Massoud, uh, the next questions are for you. There was a question, there's a few questions about AFCON and cooperation with a particular uh, African state and technical cooperation possibilities. But I think one question that was very pertinent. Désolé, ma fille est là. I will give you more candy. Can you, I'll be right there. 
but um, there was a question about current challenge, challenges for radioactive waste management, which sort of ties into the CTBT question, if you could maybe take that first. That was from Nana Abdul Malik. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Namsa. Uh, I saw this uh, question and uh, uh, in fact, yes, thank you for uh, the interest to this. Uh, as I said, the Pilindaba Treaty in uh, its Article 7 is uh, really uh, gives uh, strong importance to the management of radioactive waste in Africa, uh, including by mentioning the uh, Bamako Convention, uh, which is related to the uh, banning the import of uh, uh, radioactive wastes in, in Africa. Uh, as uh, you know, the only country which is operating a nuclear power plant is South Africa, and um, the country is managing, uh, I believe, uh, very safely and with uh, appropriate security, the, um, the uh, radioactive wastes, including uh, by creating a specialized uh, institute related to uh, radioactive wastes. Uh, and uh, but in my knowledge, there is no yet, not yet, uh, long term uh, or a deep geologic repository uh, plans, including uh, maybe in some studies or research in South Africa. But uh, the uh, IEA supported some countries to uh, consider what uh, is called the borehole uh, concept. Uh, developed by uh, uh, in collaboration with South Africa, and I believe the first uh, project and uh, demonstration uh, project uh, is uh, under implementation in Ghana. Um, thank you, <laughs> thank you for that response. Okay. Uh, there's a question about just African countries and their readiness to be able to do to benefit from AFCON initiatives and the things that we need to do. I think in one of your presentation slides, you shared a quotation from the IAEA talking about how countries were not at the level to make the best use of this technology and what is available. So maybe you can shed some light on that. Yeah, this is uh, in fact, in my previous life, uh, I was managing, uh, I was part of the AFRA management committee uh, since 1999 till 2018. So uh, field management committee before and AFRA program management committee. So uh, in these committees, we uh, each year uh, assess the contribution of each African member states to the IEA uh, AFRA, in fact, uh, including considering some uh, IEA bilateral projects. And we observed that uh, there is more or less, uh, well, uh, I don't want to give figures, uh, but uh, several, uh, really a great number of countries which uh, need to uh, strengthen their national programs to sustain their national programs in order to fully uh, absorb what the IEA is providing as expertise or as support through uh, instruments, through, uh, through advice, through projects, etc. Et and this is in fact uh, what uh, the AFRA technical uh, working group also observed in its last meeting in, uh, in July, virtual meeting, uh, of noting that less than uh, 20 national reports are forwarded to the AFRA management, which, uh, which are mandatory, in fact, to uh, really uh, manage uh, correctly the, uh, the $6 uh, million per year delivered by the IEA as a support to Africa through AFRA. So this so is, in fact, the challenge. So uh, the national institutions in charge uh, of uh, peaceful use of nuclear energy are invited really to, to, uh, to, to, to 
uh, as also advised by the IEA and by uh, uh, UNDP to coordinate uh, the national programs and to identify the, 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 the priorities at the national level in order to request the appropriate support from the IEA and to absorb all the resources provided by the IEA. So AFCON till now don't have the resources, uh, financial resources to support directly uh, the, um, the African uh, member states. But we are, uh, we are in fact uh, really uh, trying to uh, coordinate this program and to uh, attract some um, sponsors from the African Union strategic partners in order to assist or to cooperate with the African uh, mem member state which needs to do so. In addition, if you allow me, uh, we started 20 years uh, before to promote this technical cooperation among developing countries, the most advanced countries like South Africa, like Egypt or Nigeria or Ghana or other countries need to uh, and are ready in fact to uh, cooperate with the less developed countries in nuclear science and technology and to provide bilaterally, bilaterally through the support of the IEA through um, this uh, triangular projects, uh, the development in Africa by African nuclear science and technology. So for, uh, Monsieur Massoud, for the people who are in this, for the participants on this course, some people have more influence than others and they might be able to take something away from your presentation today and enact or you know, push for some sort of tangible change. How best would you advise they do that? Are there contact details that you can share so they can reach out to you bilaterally to say, hi, I'm from Zimbabwe and I would like to talk to you more about what Zimbabwe can do or what you need Zimbabwe to do and how we can get the right people at the table or in the room. My uh, brief response is uh, will be to Zimbabwe. Just go to the commissioner representing Zimbabwe and look for, for the information. No, in fact, seriously, what we uh, advise all the uh, state parties is to strengthen the national coordination with uh, the IEA national liaison officers, the AFRA national coordinators, the FNRBA uh, focal points in the, in the country, and the uh, point of contact of AFCON in their countries. We advise, in fact, each state parties to organize through the Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs such coordination meeting at the national level in order to really uh, coordinate the national programs uh, in uh, including to deliver this national re annual reports to the 1540 UN resolution, to AFCON, to IEA, to AFRA and to FNRBA and to, to be coherent at the national level and to disseminate through seminars, national seminars, uh, the information at the national level. AFCON will be um, really happy to assist on that uh, in this effort uh, in in uh, uh, in forwarding the names of these focal points or these coordinators. Please just send me an email, and I will be very pleased to, to assist. Uh, shukran Jazilan. Uh I have a question for you about Pelindaba Treaty and encouraging non-member states in Africa to ratify or to even sign for the treaty. Do, um, I guess the question was, how is AFCON encouraging this or working on this? Well, um, we discussed this issue since years, including with uh, Ambassador Minty, the first chair of the AFCON, and we decided, in fact, to, um, to, um, uh, to work at different levels with the support of the African Union Commission, the chair of the African Union Commission, the Peace and Security Council in Addis Ababa, 
to uh, uh, to uh, convince the uh, the African Union uh, member state which did not yet ratify the treaty. So, uh, but there is some issues which we are uh, in fact still optimistic. Uh, even if uh, Jan uh, presented the issue uh, raised by Egypt, in fact, which is a political issue uh, related to the Middle East nuclear weapon free zones. But I'm uh, pleased to say that uh, Morocco has already decided to ratify the treaty uh, recently and officially, but we are expecting uh, the deposit of uh, the instrument of ratification. Some African, uh, some countries uh, are still uh, uh, facing some bureaucratic, in fact, uh, challenges at the national level between the foreign affairs, uh, the cabinet, and the embassy in Addis Ababa. To, to, there is one country where the president, in fact, uh, decided with uh, uh, an, uh, an ordinance to ratify the treaty, but the instruction was not given to the embassy in Pretoria to, uh, do, to deposit the instrument since, since years. So there is some situations which are, well, uh, in, incredible. <laughs> Sorry for sorry for that. Thank you so much. Jean now, what what it's me. important also for us is to convince the uh, the nuclear weapon uh, states to ratify the protocols. This is in fact one of the challenges of all the nuclear weapon free zones, and we, this is what we discussed with uh, the other nuclear weapon free zones in Nur Sultan, trying to. Uh, um, to uh, share the experience of Latin America, uh, different approaches, different consultations, and how to uh, to uh, to uh, to reach this uh, uh, this involvement from this nuclear weapon. But we're, well, with the the new development, with the treaty banning nuclear weapons, we will see certainly new developments in this year. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Massoud. Thank you very I, much, Jean Dupré. I saw, I saw a question on uh, particle accelerators oh, from if Rose. You'd like to, if you'd like to take that, then that's fine. Yeah, I just a brief one saying that uh, this, uh, we are not creating networks just for creating networks. The objective is to uh, make available uh, and the five countries I mentioned with already operational uh, particle accelerators, a huge network in South Africa with Itemba uh, Labs, which is a really important center for national, uh, national center for accelerators with the NEXA accelerators, etc. Egypt has also operational uh, accelerators, Nigeria, Ghana, and Algeria. And these five countries uh, agreed, in fact, to provide uh, and to open their uh, infrastructure for the uh, other African uh, member states in order to fully benefit uh, from uh, the operation of these uh, uh, installations or equipment in uh, education and training in nuclear science and technology and in, uh, uh, in maybe with a link with some uh, some applications in health. So this is part of our efforts to develop this technical cooperation among African countries. And uh, well, we will try to uh, to uh, reach this and to convince and to uh, get the appropriate financial support. And I believe the IEA is uh, ready to support the first meeting of the network. And then the network need to be sustainable and to provide its own uh, its own support or to look for support from the others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Monsieur Massoud. As you were speaking about the bureaucracy that can happen for a president signing off on something and uh, the other arm of government not being aware 
uh, somebody sent me a private message saying, does this sound familiar? And I responded, I will not dignify that with a response. <laughs> but it's been great for having everyone here and getting to listen to the people who are literally on the ground and trying to make and keep Africa safe. And also in the 21st century to keep us on the board and in the game with the peaceful uses pillar of the NPT, which is very important to us. I wish you all a good evening. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email them to us, your organizers. And if they are from Ms. Aoud, we can always forward them to him.